Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this webinar on teaching international relations in the so-called periphery with our fantastic panelists from the Philippines, Lebanon, and Colombia. I am Zainab Bernoussi, or Z, from Morocco, Assistant Professor of International Politics at the newly renamed Sciences Po Africa of the International University of Rabat, and at-large Middle East North Africa representative of the Global South Caucus. This event was made possible thanks to the Global South Caucus of International Studies and the International Studies Association. Many people have helped us put, to get, put together this event and among them, special thanks go to our chair, Deligi Eric Dejila, the ISA Director of Academic Development, Tiki Lembe, and Walid Hasboun, the at-large MENA representative before me. This panel brings in the experiences of academics in their research and pedagogy of IR as they experience and interact with different cultural regions. The main aims of the discussion are to first present how teaching IR is experienced and lived in the periphery, and second, what such a teaching tells us about the limits and opportunities of enriching the study and understanding of societies around the world. Our speakers come to us with three important uh, works, among others, to check out, and I will be sharing the titles here in the um, uh, chat. International Relations from the Global South, Worlds of Difference, edited by Arlene B. Tickner and Karen Smith, Routledge 2019. International Studies in the Philippines, Mapping New Frontiers in Theory and Practice, edited by Francis Antoinette Cruz, Nassif Manabilang Adyong, Routledge 2020. The Politics of Teaching IR in the Arab World, Reading Walt in Beirut, Wend in Doha, and Abu Fadl in Cairo by May Darwish, Morten Valbu, Basel, Salouh, Walid Hasboun, Amira Abu Samra, Saeed Sadiqi, Adham Sauli, uh, Hamad Al Belushi, and Karim Makdisi, International Studies Perspectives 2020. The discussion will, be, will run for about 40 minutes and will have about 20 minute questions and answers from the audience. Before we start, let me uh, briefly introduce our inspiring speakers. Arlene B. Tickner is Professor of International Relations in the School of International Political and Urban Studies at the Universidad del Rosario, Bogota, Colombia. Frances Antoinette Cruz is Assistant Professor of German at the College of Arts and Letters, University of the Philippines, Diliman and the co-convener of the Decolonial Studies Program at the Center for Integrative and Development Studies at the same university, also at large South and Southeast Asian Pacific representative of the Global South Caucus. Karim Makdisi is an Associate Professor of International Relations and Director of the Program in Public Policy and International Affairs at uh, the American University of Beirut. We will start uh, with a question uh, and let the discussion lead us or and uh, also bring in other questions. So the first one uh, is about your experience, our panelists. Can you tell us about your work on teaching international relations in the periphery? What does it mean to teach IR uh, in the so-called periphery? Is it an experience of precarity and margins and how so? Okay. Sure. Please, thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Francis Cruz. Many people call me Frankie. I've uh, worked at uh, the University of the Philippines and uh, my main affiliation, as Zainaba said, is the College of Arts and Letters, but I've also taught as an affiliate faculty at the Center for International Studies and as another affiliate faculty at uh, a private university, Miriam College, at the Department of International Studies. And 
what we've been doing in, in, um, in terms of the Professional Association for International Studies in the Philippines, and I think that's where a lot of my insights on teaching and research in uh, international relations has come from, is we've been conducting uh, focus group discussions all over the country with teachers um, who, who are in IR, international studies, global studies, there are many uh, related uh, degree programs, and we've been talking to them about their needs. And uh, within this um, initiative, we've also handled the, uh, the TRIP survey. And I think the TRIP survey is, uh, has offered many interesting insights into um, some of the issues that uh, teachers face in the Philippines in particular, but also in the global south and the global north, actually, since it's a, a, a global survey. And some of these issues we bring up in the book, International Studies in the Philippines. And one of the things that we, we noticed is how much structural constraints affect the teaching of international relations and how international relations is defined in the Philippines. Um, this is quite particular, I think, to the Philippines, but it's, it's possible that there are other countries that experience this kind of thing. And that's because all, almost all degree programs, particularly in public universities in the Philippines, are um, are subject to a commission on higher education memorandum. So this kind of memorandum order um, provides guidelines for the curriculum. And many schools are encouraged to follow the guidelines, may be or may not be punished for not doing so in terms of recognition. So I'm not a legal expert, so I'm not really sure what non-compliance entails. But um, it's under this memorandum order that international relations falls under political science, for example, and um, perhaps just one or two classes with some electives are possible uh, under the realm of political science. International studies, however, does not have a CMO. That means that any institution is free to teach international studies, however, which way they want to. And I think these are two extremes of rigidity. So you either conform with our prescribed curriculum, or you can't open a political science um, degree program, or you can do whatever you want under international studies or global studies. So on the one hand, rigidity um, constrains change, I think, because it's very difficult to change these set guidelines. You have to go through many legalities and processes, et cetera. And um, too much flexibility, on the other hand, makes it difficult for academics to communicate with each other about a specific topic like the idea of the international, because uh, sometimes when we talk to teachers, it was more like, oh, um, international studies, that's tourism, because that's what it means to understand the international local level, which is very interesting. At the same time, it's hard to have a conversation with um, academics who are into uh, tourism, for example. Um, and I think that all of us share, I think in the global south, difficulties in getting funding for research, particularly theoretical research. And um, it's not in many universities, at least rewarded by any form of promotion. Sometimes uh, writing for a newspaper or um, appearing on TV gets equal points to publishing an article in a journal. So you can see why people are then encouraged to do the, you know, appear on TV rather than research for a journal article. Um, which is why when we met the teachers from all over the Philippines, and there is a core periphery problem in the Philippines, so a lot of things are centered in Manila, um, they were more interested in finding a textbook that was approved by this commission on higher education, rather than talking about theory or talking about uh, the curriculum or how to teach international. They were more like, okay, where's the textbook and tell us how to teach the textbook. And then that's, that's more of what we're interested in. So um, maybe I'll, I'll stop for now uh, and we can talk a bit about it later. So, yeah. Thank you. Karim maybe, or Fabien? If Karim is able to speak, if he has a connection, I will. Yes, please go ahead. See to him, but I don't see him <laughs> coming. Um, I'll go while his connection is, is restored. Um, I, thank you. Um, I want to thank the Global South Caucus for organizing this conversation. Um, I like very much the fact that it is unscripted and that we can talk um, about our different experiences. Um, I, I want to uh, approach the question um, posed from perhaps a different angle, although everything that Frankie has said resonates quite strongly with, with 
probably with, with my own experiences um, in Colombia and in Latin America. I also participate in the TRIP survey. Um, I, I've coordinated the survey in several countries of Latin America um, during uh, the different rounds that it's been applied outside of the United States. And maybe after we'll have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about what um, that survey reveals in terms of, of the, the, the IR professoriate um, in, in, in regions um, of the global south. Um, I also have thought quite a bit about these, um, you know, core periphery divides within countries, variations in levels of training. Um, and I think all of that plays out quite clearly, um, Frankie, in other settings of the Global South, including Latin America, where it's very clear, um, not only kind of different types of construct structural constraints, but also these divides between um, universities in the capital and outside universities that are much more um, networked with you know, global uh, institutions, um, universities that are much more internationalized, um, et cetera. So these are all, I think, key points that maybe we can talk more about when we reach the conversation. Um, Z had asked us to tell a, a little bit about ourselves. And so that's where I'm going to start. I um, was born in the United States, um, but have lived and worked in Colombia um, for over 30 years. Um, and I guess something else that I should mention is that I was not trained in international relations when I became a professor of international relations and IR theory. So my process um, um, of socialization has been somewhat different, I think, from, from, from those of others. Um, and, and it's an important point because I didn't receive, um, I didn't receive um, academic training um, in the field before I started teaching um, in a country that you know I was not born in, and that has very diverse experiences of the of the international as compared to to my country of birth, the United States. And so I just want to talk about that for a minute and how I think that has affected at least my my approach and my understanding of teaching IR in the periphery. Um, I live in Colombia, a country that has been at war for over fifty years that although um, uh, you know, conducted a negotiation with one of the largest um, insurgent groups, FARC, several years ago, um, is very far from being considered a country at peace, um, given the, the prevalence of other um, insurgent groups and of a, a large number of, of organized criminal organizations. Um, in addition to organized crime, or in tandem with organized crime, we have you know, tremendously high levels of political violence, um, a, a serious a uh, drug trade problem, Colombia um, supplies the, the majority of cocaine to the United States and other countries in the world. Um, increasingly um, organized crime activities related to natural resources. Um, and in terms of its relations with the world, um, a very inward looking and parochial country um, whose foreign policy is translated um, primarily in um, strong levels of association with the United States and surprisingly, perhaps for some pro-Americanism. Um, and I think these are factors that at least um, have marked my understanding of, of what it means to teach um, in the periphery. Um, when I started teaching, and I'll try to be quick to not go on about my personal history, I, I hadn't received training. So I essentially just received um, inputs and support from colleagues who had been trained in, in the mainstream. Um, and quickly, when, when I started reproducing this in the classroom, um, started realizing that, that this didn't um, necessarily work tremendously well in a teaching context that was um, so different in terms of lived experiences of my students um, than those uh, assumed by, by mainstream approaches. And, and I think in my case in particular, being US born and teaching in a context such as Columbia, um, this has, has pretty much marked um, my approach to both teaching and research in the field in terms of um, my own consciousness and self-reflexivity about what it means to be a US born academic um, teaching and researching in a context such as Columbia, who works on the global south, who's increasingly recognized as um, a, a representative of the global south, even though she's white, American, um, Anglo-Saxon, English speaking, um, et cetera. Um, and, and I think this is you know, pretty much led to um, at least attempts in the classroom to, to, to be, um, tremendously sensitive to this and to devise alternative ways in which one can go about um, teaching IR um, in a fashion that resonates more effectively with students. And, and I'm just gonna stop with the, this final idea. The, the, the main purpose of this textbook 
that we've just published, um, it, it, it just came out, it's 2020, um, it, it is to um, approach the, 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 the experiences of the Global South at the level of teaching. Um, I think the, the, the collective that produced this textbook shares the sensation that a lot of this has been done at the level of research, um, but that in teaching, um, we, we continue to reproduce um, the mainstream canon for, for X or Y reasons, which we could talk about later, and that it's really fundamental to start thinking about, you know, what it means to teach IR in the periphery and how you might go about doing so in a way that simply doesn't um, reproduce mainstream know-hows and, and take as the starting point of our teaching, um, you know, Western or Northern experiences of the international. And maybe in the, in the next rounds, we can talk about how one might go about trying to do that. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Uh, well, at first I just wanted also to thank Z and everyone for inviting me to this panel and I really uh, look forward to the discussion. And I am also glad that this is more of a discussion format uh, for this kind of uh, really important theme and something that's growing. And, uh, and I, I hope we'll be able to also have some, some good questions and discussion with the audience. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I want to add as well for what uh, the my co-panelists have already said. I, I'm not going to, you know, I, I think there's a lot of commonalities uh, with what each of us probably has to deal with uh, in these different regions. I, I would say just by way of starting, I mean, I, you know, just looking at, at the question that she asked us. I mean, I, I work now, uh, I've been teaching at the American University of Beirut for the past 15 years or so. <clears throat> and uh, I teach undergraduate and graduate level courses in international affairs, you know, international politics, um, and uh, uh, you know, among other things. And I, I would, you know, just looking, I was just jotting down for the article that I just recently published on this, uh, all the different events that we've gone through in Lebanon, in the region, in the Middle East over the past 15 or 20 years or so, and, you know, starting, I, I would say, you know, you could go back as far as you want, but certainly the Iraq war in 2003, the American invasion of Iraq, that is to say, and the occupation and all that comes after that, including the production of ISIS and Haida, all of these different things that come out uh, of that really quite seminal war for, for our region and how uh, it not only shaped it geopolitically, but just the way we think about it, the way we teach it, the way in which interventions have been shaped and resistances in a sense have also been shaped throughout the region until this day. Uh, in Lebanon, we've also had multiple Israeli invasions or incursions, you know, most dramatically in 2006, uh, when, when the Israelis invaded again. And, um, you know, and that was quite a traumatic and also seminal war uh, on the local kind of Lebanese level. <clears throat> and when I grew up in Beirut, we, we also had to live through, you know, different Israeli invasions as well. So that's another, something which kind of, you know, this sense of always having to teach either as a student or teach as a, as a professor in these constant events that are always happening around us. Uh, of course, recently there was the Arab uprisings that began in, you know, in 2010 onwards in, in Egypt, Tunisia, etc. And, it, you know, eventually, of course, it impacts us here on, on multiple levels. Uh, you have, of course, the Iranian-Saudi kind of rivalry, which has very local impact for us. Uh, through the Arab uprisings, you had then an increasing kind of Gulf Turkish, uh, um, you know, let's say um, rivalry that's also has our part, including a big war in Syria. Um, and most recently, about a year and a half ago, we had our own kind of uprising in Lebanon, such as it was, but, you know, we've had a total collapse of the state. Uh, we've had inflation reaching around 200%. We've the, the, our, our national currency, which was pegged to the US dollar is now, is now depreciated around 85% of its value. So there's poverty has now reached 50% of the country. This unemployment is huge. So over the past year and a half, we've been under basically total collapse. I mean, I speak, we have only 10 hours a day of electricity and that's in Beirut, let alone the peripheral areas of Lebanon itself, which is in a much worse uh, situation. So I, I'm trying to make the point that, that you know, just teaching in this kind of environment, I and mean, you're constantly responding to events uh, um, that are very clearly, as far as the way people perceive it, the way students perceive it, the way, you know, most professors also perceive it, 
is things that are in part out of our control. It's kind of outside interventions in one form or the other, but also what a kind of responsibility to try to build in what, what different scholars from the global south and this kind of global turn of IR uh, try to emphasize, I fully subscribe to in, in my own pedagogy and my own teaching, which is to say, okay, yes, we have to focus on interventions. This is clear, you know, from colonial history until, uh, you know, this the regular forms of intervention that, that continue to this day. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have to, we have a responsibility to teach about our own agency, agency in the global south in general, the Middle East, uh, in Lebanon, in Palestine, and different areas like this. And so things that are not necessarily, uh, you know, that you find particularly in the IR journals or IR textbooks, which focus on the ways in which uh, sort of so-called local or, or, you know, local to us in any case, uh, uh, actors uh, not just respond, but also shape the events that are happening through international organizations. I've written a lot about the United Nations and the way in which events on the ground here kind of go back to the United Nations itself and informs the way in which the UN itself acts. I mean, people, I think, you know, sometimes when I mention, for instance, uh, that, that, you know, the whole institution of peacekeeping was created around in the Arab world and in fact, uh, around the question of Palestine and the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, you know, there's all sorts of institutions and agencies that come out. The first refugee agency was around Palestine. So there's a lot of international to so-called local kind of or national or regional interactions, which in a sense, I, I feel a responsibility to teach. Uh, and, and I find interesting just in my own personal kind of way, in a sense, I find it very interesting that in fact, most of our students are uh, find our sense of agency, the, the least convincing part of, of what we try to teach. I mean, they, they just don't, not all of them, but a, a lot of them, or at least until we kind of really start pushing in the course a little bit, they don't think that there is agency, that we are completely at the, you know, that in this kind of realist idea of power politics from above, and we basically are simply, uh, you know, respond to that. At best, we can maybe respond to that, but we, we certainly, there's not much agency. So ideas of agency, ideas of resistances that, that a number of scholars, including Ashari and others, of course, have, have written a lot about. And I think this is, I think these are things that are, that are really important and shape the way, you know, I personally teach. Uh, so this kind of responding to live events, uh, discussing uh, resistances and also trying to spread out a little bit this the, the the various theoretical and conceptual approaches which of course are remain hugely important so it's not at all about taking any parochial uh, uh, kind of ideas of trying to understand IR or trying to teach IR but also just trying to maybe experiment a little bit more to see what makes sense at the beginning of a course and then as we go through it to see, it's interesting how I, I, I tend to see that students, especially the graduate students, tend to uh, change a little bit in, in, in what they think makes more sense theoretically and conceptually as, as a course kind of goes through when we use a lot of cases from the Middle East, from the Iraq war uh, onwards, especially kind of in the, in the contemporary uh, phase. So uh, just to, you know, uh, maybe just one other thing that we can come to later, Another thing that shapes the way I've been, you know, uh, interacting, let's say, with with the classroom, with teaching, with thinking about IR, is that I've helped uh, create a master's or a graduate program in public policy and international affairs, um, and that I, I spent about two or three years actually researching that and traveling to various parts of the global south, including to India, including China, including South Africa, and different places, in order to figure out what does it mean to teach international affairs from Lebanon in that sense. So not, you know, so again, not to be parochial, but to try to think what are the main questions and, and ways of thinking that are relevant and that we can somehow share in different parts of the global south. Uh, so the ambition was huge, the, the, the idea was huge, and then you come up against you know institutional barriers that basically end up limiting what we can or can't do. And you know maybe we can talk about that. Um, so so it is informed as well by this. And I just wanted to you know, throw this out and maybe uh, we can bring this into the discussion as well. So that, I would say that. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, from all of you, I think we, yeah, there were here, um, for me, some maybe uh, echoing of my own experience also as a, you know, just an academic teaching I in the periphery, so forgiveness of the constraints, uh, so uh, 
for my case, uh, coming back to my uh, home, Morocco, uh, and definitely the point on responsibility agency. I think that's that's um, yeah, definitely uh, is something that I that's uh, where I see parallels. Um, I, I would just add uh, regarding uh, the, the the issues of funding that that Frankie mentioned regarding theoretical. Um, uh, uh, disciplines, the same is here, and it's also um, dependent also on sometimes um, other interests. So, for instance, migration, Morocco being a transit country uh, for uh, migrants from the, the continental Europe. So that is, for instance, a, a source of, of funding. Um, now, another question, and uh, this is uh, also coming a bit from my experience teaching uh, in my second language, uh, doing research and writing in the third, in a third language. And I'm sure our panelists uh, have something to say about this here. Um, so I was wondering if you can uh, tell us what are the advantages and disadvantages of navigating different languages and sometimes even dealing with different approaches to uh, making sense of things. Um, this is an interesting question, uh, and I think I'd, I'd like to kind of talk, link this to the first question. Uh, my biography is, is that I grew up in uh, the Middle East, and then I moved to the Philippines when I was uh, a teenager, and then continued to study there. So uh, the, the, one of the national languages of the Philippines is not actually my, my mother tongue, because I was raised in, in a European language, which also gives me identity issues, who am I, etc., is that colonial, all these types of things. Um, and what, what I find interesting is, is that the, the, the Philippines has, despite having English as an official language, and, and uh, most of our classes from, I, I, most of the classes in the Philippines starting from grade one are taught in English. Uh, social sciences are taught in Filipino in kind of an attempt to bifurcate uh, knowledge sources. So the sciences are taught in, in English and uh, the social sciences tend to be taught in, in Filipino. I, I don't know if they've done this for uh, the other regional languages because the Philippines is a very multilingual country, it's 180 plus languages. Um, but uh, when you get to the college level, all of social science teaching reverts back to English because of the simply because of the breadth and depth of literature that is available in English. Um, and the Philippines no longer uses Spanish, for example, so that's not a source of um, a, a knowledge. So it's a very Anglophone kind of academic world. And I think that this resonates across Southeast Asia because every time we have talks, ASEAN, for example, um, inter-academic networking in Southeast Asia, you have two cultures, the Anglophone culture and I think a Sinophone culture. Um, therefore, this has a lot to do with language politics within the larger region itself, uh, I think. Um, however, a lot of uh, authors, and some of them who have written for the edited volume, have suggested that we, we ought to revisit the question of language, because in language is, is, is kind of like a, a, a way of producing ontology, right? So with your language, you name objects, and therefore you also name concepts and ways of looking at the world. So in order to create concepts that come from maybe regions like Southeast Asia or that articulate experiences of those in the global South or even those in the periphery within the periphery, uh, it, it's necessary to revisit uh, concepts that have been erased by untranslatability issues into English or other European languages or maybe even other Asian languages. Um, and, and therefore comes the suggestion to uh, introduce uh, maybe teaching in Filipino, that was one suggestion, although this is also quite problematic. One can argue that the Philippines is inherently multilingual. And I think if you look at other disciplines like linguistics, they have many interesting projects that may be relevant for IR, but it's a completely different discipline. Like they take a concept, so in, in some linguistics um, faculty in my university are taking certain concepts and seeing if these concepts resonate across uh, the region in Southeast Asia. And that can be done for concepts relevant to the international. So that has been a suggestion of one way to incorporate the local into um, the teaching of IR, to look at conceptual, ontological, philosophical concepts inherent in the different languages in the country, in the region, and kind of use that as a way to link the I to the international, the everyday to the, the global. Um, so that's one, one kind of theoretical maybe approach to it. 
Uh, for more practical reasons, I, I do think that language does create hierarchy simply because those who can understand write in English are therefore more able to understand the, the readings for collegiate level international relations um, classes. So perhaps there have been some inequalities, um, yet again, regional and urban, rural, there are that kind of, there's those kinds of um, separations in that. Um, but I, I don't think that, well, it's hard to say really. Um, I, I, I don't think that the regional languages, on one hand, they, they do need to be revived. On the other hand, they seem to be completely absent from the formalities of everyday teaching. Um, when, when regional languages are used, and I'm not talking about Philippine, I'm talking about um, auxiliary languages in the Philippines, they're used to communicate everyday things. Um, and I, I think this is quite a challenge for, you know, colonized countries that were kind of where lines were arbitrarily drawn and now we all have to speak one language and might lead to language death of many of those unused languages. So it's just my thoughts for this issue. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting question that we could probably approach from a number of, of different angles. I I'm, think I'm going to be brief um, and just try to compliment. Um, I, um, when Z posed this question, she spoke about herself as well. And so I, I, I research, um, I think, and I research uh, both in English and in Spanish. Um, I, I, I do, I, I have kind of different tracks of research activity and design, kind of geared to, to both audiences. I teach in Spanish, um, curiously, even though there's a big push um, here and elsewhere in Latin America to teach in English, I do not teach in English. Um, all of my teaching experience um, since I started uh, become since I started as a professor has been in Spanish and I must confess it's going to sound funny um, that I feel almost uncomfortable um, doing so in English um, even at academic conferences I, I have a hard time sometimes articulating my ideas um, as fluidly in English as in Spanish um, but I use um, mostly I teach um, I teach IR theory primarily um, at the undergraduate level. And, and unfortunately, most of the readings um, have to be in English. And so there's a strange mix going on there between languages. Um, something that I've, you know, found, I find um, interesting, um, not in a positive way, is, is how um, the classics, um, meaning the mainstream theories, are, are, are largely available um, in, in, in Spanish or Portuguese or other languages. Um, um, but critical approaches to IR theory um, are not. And so basically, if you want to teach um, critical approaches, there's several questions here about post-colonialism and decolonial. I use both. Decolonial, um, decoloniality comes from Latin America. So there's some texts in Spanish that one can use. But largely, um, all of the other approaches, um, you know, you have to make use of, of texts in English. And so I think this I think this creates kind of, you know, concern about whether to what extent we're reproducing um, linguistic imperialism in the classroom when we insist that students have to 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 read or you know and write and speak in English. Um, and I think this also contrasts strongly um, with forms of thought and writing in other languages. I notice this in Spanish. Um, it's just not the same um, to think and to write in Spanish as it is in English. Um, and I think the same could be said of other languages. There's been work done in IR on French, for example, and how thinking and writing in French um, doesn't conform to the types of standards that apply to, to English. Um, and this obviously affects scholars and students' ability to insert then into um, you know, global circuits in which English continues to be the, the lingua franca. Um, I am all for multilingual education and introducing you know, multilingual and multi-ontological forms of, of being and, and thought into the classroom. I haven't actually figured out how one goes about doing that, although I've, I'm increasingly thinking about that in my, in my research and writing. Um, one final thing that I just want to mention, um, Karim mentioned um, institutional obstacles, and we've talked about a little bit about financial obstacles. One thing that I have thought about quite a bit is, is the need to obviously 
create connections between peripheral sites um, that don't have to go through um, the cores in order to take place, right? And, and, and I think this poses the, 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 the challenge of, of what common language we use to do so. Um, so we could have obviously direct connections within um, at least Spanish speaking Latin America, we could have direct connections taking place, you know, within at least, you know, former British colonies where English is a little more easy to use. We could have it, you know, within the Arab world. We could have it within, you know, ex-French, you know, ex-French colonies where French could be the lingua franca. But the question is how you do so globally um, without making use of English, um, and 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 to what extent that the need to continue using English doesn't again then create the problem of reproducing, um, um, you know, linguistic um, forms of imperialism. And and I don't really have an easy answer to that, but I, but I do want to point out that um, in addition to structural obstacles to striking up conversations that are direct and not mediated by the North or the West, we have this other, you know, language challenge of, of how to go about doing so in, in a way that makes it feasible to, to have these conversations and to actually access to um, conversations and research activities that are taking place across different sites of the periphery or the global South which we actually can't access due to lack of um, distribution and circulation or access to those different languages in which this is taking place. Thank you. Sorry, I'm unmuting myself. Um, yeah, th this is, this is um, you know, th this is a really interesting question. I, I, I mean, I'm, in, in a curious place where, you know, I teach at the American University of Beirut, so English is the language, you know, with which we teach. Uh, so in that sense, we are, I mean, the reality is that we are the core to the periphery and, and you know, other institutions in other parts of Lebanon, uh, for sure. Uh, and students that come, you know, often there's a, there's a mix and sometimes the students that come to us, uh, English is not their primary language. And so they have to go through all these kinds of English tests in order to, to enter AUB. But after that, the reality is that they, you know, students will struggle with reading. So one has to be very careful with, you know, how many, how, how much one can give in terms of reading, how much they, especially the theoretical language, how much can they absorb when they're reading, you know, in some cases, the third language after Arabic and French, for instance. Uh, so th there's a, there is an increasingly this kind of mix that's a bit difficult to try to navigate within, within certain classes. Um, so that's that's just that's just one thing to to, to bear in mind. I, I mean, there's but there's a lot of there's been a lot of research, and of course, uh, uh, Arlene has has been one of the the main people sort of you know leading this uh, sort of looking at global IR and different regions. Uh, but for instance, a colleague of mine, Sarah Hanafi, has has written a lot about how uh, written, but also in sort of empirically shown how. Uh, there's a kind of big disconnect between the, the, the knowledge production that's happening in mostly in English, maybe in some cases in French, and the fact that most people in the Arab world, of course, are speaking Arabic in, in the public universities, that is to say, not the private, some of the, the more elite private universities such as AUB and, and the American University of Cairo and, and some places like this, but across the public universities where the, where the resources are really very, very limited. Um, and this is true of the Lebanese University here in, in, in Lebanon. And so there's, there's a, this disconnect between what we're trying to teach, what we're trying to do, at the same time, the language within which most of the public universities and sort of public in general are able to, to, to grasp. So it's in many ways, AUB is one of these universities that's connected to the core. I mean, we, we, can, we complain that sort of, you know, north, south, we're very much south in that sense, but but otherwise, we are much more connected. I'm more likely to meet with, meet with, let's say, Arlene than I am to meet some, in some cases with some public universities, certainly in the Arab region, in Morocco and other places. I wouldn't, it would be very difficult for me to access for all sorts of reasons. Uh, it, not just for the fact that even visas, I can't go to, you know, if I was a Lebanese passport holder, I wouldn't be able to go to, to, to you know, a big chunk of the Arab world. So that's, you know, again, it's, it's language and visa barriers. It's, it's, uh, it's the politics that means that there's a lot of uh, it, historical, or at least over the past 10, 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of blocking of possibilities of creating an Arab region. You know, there's a, there's a political project that, that has been tried to block that. Uh, part of it, of course, comes from outside intervention. And part of it now is the kind of regional rivalries that are dividing up the region into different kinds of spheres of influence. 
Um, so there is this, I mean, there's also the relationship between, you know, both linguistic and cultural in the sense between, uh, so let's say universities in Lebanon and, and in sort of the Levant area, the Mashra area, and those for instance in the Gulf, where the huge amount of money and resources are now all located in the Gulf. Um, but at the same time, the, the kind of forms of government that are there are not, don't necessarily always lead to freedom of expression and, and you know, uh, developing critical thought. But you do have these, these you know, uh, American campuses in Gulf countries where literally in those circles, they may or may not be allowed to say what they want as long as they're talking or publishing in English. But you can't really do that in Arabic or other thing, and you can't really be critical in those areas. So those areas have a lot of the resources, a lot of the money. They're attracting a lot of the professors and a lot of the faculty over the past year here in Lebanon because of the crisis. Many people are going to the Gulf and outside. Uh, so there, there's, there are all these kinds of divides and barriers that are both linguistic, but also political and cultural in, in that sense. Uh, so maybe one other point to bring up, and, and Z, maybe you can talk about this too, which is this, you know, I was part of creating the Arab Council in the Social Sciences, which was a kind of a social science, including, you know, so, including IR, but sort of social science in general within the Arab region about 10 years ago or so, uh, there was this big push to form a social science kind of research council for the entire region that would bring everybody together and primarily try to get across in, in Arabic, try to promote, especially for young scholars, for students, PhD students and young scholars, to try to kind of leverage a lot of the, the research that's taken place and having them network with each other and benefit from the kind of scholarship that's on the outside. And that I think has been quite successful, but there's been a lot of challenges to this. Um, you know, which you know maybe we can talk about, including language barriers and issues. And Z, maybe you, you can also talk about this. Thank you. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I just uh, want to go back to one of the points you said earlier. I mean, I, I uh, really love what the uh, Arab Council of Social Sciences is, is doing. Um, but I think uh, the, the challenges of uh, seeing maybe less collaboration between um, uh, uh, academics, institutions in the region. I think this is, uh, yeah, something that's that uh, needs to to, to change, um, and also mobility. I mean, uh, we we've held uh, conferences here in Morocco where um, there were problems to have people from the region come here. Um, um, yeah, so I, I think also the, the, the point of, of Arlene regarding uh, English being a sort of catch-22 <laughs> problem of, of um, uh, being the language of, of the, the, the hegemony, but at the same time uh, talking about, uh, well, uh, decolonizing the field and as Frankie mentioned, revisiting maybe local concepts. So just, uh, I was just also thinking, for instance, about um, uh, well, right now, the celebration of the Arab Spring, this is something that is very much uh, promoted by the ACSS. And actually, we don't, I, I, I also find that it's, I see it more talked about outside the region than in the region, by scholars outside the region than in the region. Um, yeah, and for instance, they're using terms, so the Spring, the Arab Spring, uh, or, or now the, the term, Arabic term of Herak, that, that uh, may, uh, uh, well, speak more to the context. Um, so we, we can go back to this discussion, but I just also wanted to uh, take us to another um, question, uh, maybe to, to start closing the um, discussion about what can be learned from teaching IR in the periphery. Uh, and uh, here I'll just uh, uh, want to maybe quickly mention a, a, a project that I'm starting with colleagues from Puerto Rico, Lebanon, and Italy, Adriana Garriga Lopez, Bashir Saad, and uh, Giuliano Martiniello on teaching international political economy uh, in the so-called periphery and seeing key concepts of the field, uh, such as capital, labor, and land, um, in this periphery, so how they can be uh, thought of differently because they they do they do have different meanings uh, uh, here. So um, yeah. 
I keep on thinking, I, I wish I could say something like revolutionary, like struggle and solidarity across the global South is what we learn from teaching in the global. Like, I, I think this is to a certain degree true. Um, and uh, maybe I can talk a bit about what we did in, in the book uh, in relation to what we can learn about teaching in the global South. So in, in my chapter, I, talk, I, I text mined a whole lot of articles from in the 1980s till about 2016. So these were all the journal articles that had to do with some international topic in um, several Philippine journals, just to see what is, is there a local, when you talk about the international without necessarily having to refer to realism or the Navy, the military, or these kinds of institutions, what do we talk about? So what do others, maybe people in the humanities or doing multidisciplinary stuff, what do they talk about when they talk about the international? And of course, there were the, the trending topics, and they were always trending. So whatever is going on in Asia, the Ch South China Sea, and a nuclear issue with the two Koreas, and then um, all these types of things were, of course, trending. But at the same time, you can see this underlying kind of we all migration and diaspora is also important. For example, the, the Philippines sends a lot of labor out uh, overseas, and that structures the way we think about the international, the foreign international relations. Uh, many ordinary Filipinos see the international as a way to get money, kind of this mendicancy issue, because their, their family members go abroad, they work as um, sailors, seamen, um, domestic helpers, or might, sometimes even professionals, uh, whichever it is. And, and that's their relation to it. They hear the stories of these people, and then that's what they imagine. And usually they're quite positive stories because nobody likes talking about the negative aspects of migration, right? Because you can't shame your family, for example. There was a lot of people to people relations. So now um, the Philippine passport is accepted in many ASEAN countries, uh, travel restrictions, budget planes have allowed many to go to Japan and South Korea, at least from the middle class. And that has affected the scope of the international. A lot of these things are talked about, but not necessarily related to uh, IR theories, concepts, even the discipline. And I found that very interesting that there's a lot of work going on from other scholars, other disciplines that could possibly be related and seen through an IR lens that are not being connected um, for various reasons. I'm not gonna get into those reasons. Um, I also think that the global south is a great way to look at the approach the international through different perspectives like boats approaching an island i think this is a metaphor used from an article that i read from area studies that it's not just you know the anglophone white western way of approaching the island there are many vantage points by which you can look at the specific issue but that's the challenge right and how do you do that linguistically or maybe uh this there was this great article by uh that I read about first thinking about who you are and how you fit into the world. And then kind of from there, that's where you start um, theorizing, conceptualizing, linking yourself and your region and your area to the international. So I think that this, this maybe multiplicity, uh, the struggle of simply surviving resilience in under such terrible conditions politically, I mean, Asia as well, at Africa, Middle East, Latin America, I'm sure many of us have worked under terrible conditions sometimes, even like in this COVID era, <laughs> Wi-Fi, for example, or uh, understanding that some students, for example, in the Philippines don't have access to the internet, that they have to, their, their parents have to come up with some ways to get decent internet or to, to pay for internet or to pay for a laptop. Um, and, and, and there's something to learn in this, but, uh, I think baby steps, you know, I mean, I, I think it's great that there are now ways for which the global south can talk to each other, like through conferences like this. And at the same time, there are very practical and structural issues that still have to be overcome. Um, and that's easier said than done. Right. So I can talk all day about theories and some individual profs might be inspired by that and then change their syllabus accordingly, but they can't it's so hard to change the structure up there that dictates what you do and the external world that kind of, where there's a knowledge hierarchy, linguistic hierarchy, that kind of thing. So I, I think that uh, moving forward, we ought to show like this, this fighting spirit, resilience. I hope that that's something that we can learn from the Grow the South um, and being respect, respectful of different perspectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I'm going to try to make just a couple of points on this question. Um, I wish that I could say that the Global South, um, you know, teaches us to be resilient and respectful of difference. Uh, sadly, uh, at least where I live, um, respect for difference, um, I, you know, is quite is quite limited, um, which is why we have such a, a horrific situation of political violence going on. So, um, I I think I think it's important to distinguish between. Um, global south experiences um, you know of the international and perhaps what critical theoretical lenses um, largely derived from those global south experiences might might teach us about resilience respect for difference um, co conversation with difference um, etc and and I think I, I think the two are, are different but just I, I had I had to react. Maybe Frankie and I can talk about that after when, when we start conversing. But I think it's a, a fundamental point. Um, I I want to just try to lay out what we tried to do in this textbook that that we produced. Um, the textbook took um, six years or more to to, to publish. Um, it was very hard to do um, for a number of reasons. But I think one of the main reasons is that. We really haven't given enough attention to how to decenter um, our teaching. Um, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, within distinct um, critical IR circles, both in the North and in the South. Um, feminism would be one of the first, obviously, about how we decenter our narratives um, about the international. But I think at the level of teaching, it really hasn't been done. Um, systematically. Um, and I think the fact that it took so long to do this textbook speaks to that to that lack. So the, 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 the positive, uh, the positive um, reading of this is that there's still a world of activity to be, to be done in terms of how to teach IR in, in a way that's decentered and that doesn't take the canon or the ABC or whatever you want to call it as its starting point. Um, and I think in this sense, um, teaching in the periphery actually does lend itself to, um, you know, how you, how you might go about doing this. So the, the way that we try to, to approach this issue in, in the textbook um, is, is to explore um, different experiences, um, uh, uh, you know, of the international um, that arise in different um, Global South contexts. Um, as a starting point for talking about concepts and categories that, you know, indeed have been central to the field, but that when we, you know, talk about how they're experienced from distinct geocultural sites, start taking on um, distinct guises. And so instead of starting off um, with the canon and the ways in which conventional IR would approach these concepts and categories, what we try to do is start with stories um, that automatically decenter and you know unsettle um, the ways in which we then go about talking about the state or security or globalization or the international or war and conflict or peace um, and whatnot. And so you know I think this is important because indeed um, I, I strongly do believe that 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 experience of the, the different experiences of the international with which students obviously can identify, um, you know. Are, are, are distinct um, in, in, in diverse peripheral settings. Um, so this is, this is one of, this is one of the, the, the lessons, I think, from teaching IR on the periphery. And something that came up as we did this exercise is, is obviously it's not a very surprising finding. When, when you decenter in this way, it's also possible then to show how um, Global South or peripheral experiences of the international and of these distinct concepts and categories are also of use for rethinking and decentering how the North or how the, how the West experiences them. Because all of these narratives obviously simplify and distort um, Northern experiences as well. And so that's another important thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, Global South narratives on the international um, notwithstanding efforts to, to make them so, you know, are, are actually in a capacity to speak about um, northern experiences of the world. And, and I think that's another aspect that I would that I would probably add to to what at least I've learned about about teaching IR in the periphery. And just 
maybe one final, final point, all of these difficulties that Frankie and that Karim has have pointed to um, actually do make us more resilient in terms of our research, research abilities. Um, I, I at least find that trying to do research or exposing students to any type of field experience um, in a country such as Colombia is tremendously challenging. Um, we're talking about experiences that take place in, in, in war zones in some cases, you know, under tremendous um, situations of insecurity, duress, um, et cetera. And, and I think that actually, um, that actually, at, you know, at a more human level, um, you know, actually does require um, tremendous degrees of creativity, um, you know, audacity um, that, that feed into different ways of doing research and learning about international relations that I think could be of use for also speaking to the North about how we go about teaching subjects as, as this one. And I'll stop there. I'll just, maybe I'll just say a word because I know you want to get to the questions before we end. Uh, just to build that, I mean, I, I agree 100% with, with, uh, with what Frankie and, uh, and Arlene have been saying. I just thought that, you know, and in, in we talk about decentering, uh, you know, I, I think it is important, you know, what, what in, from the so-called periphery, I mean, clearly decentering and destabilizing some of the concepts that are at the core of IR is, is, is I think, hugely important. I mean, thinking about sovereignty, uh, you know, if you just take Lebanon, of all countries in the world, if you just take Lebanon and you try to figure out what does sovereignty mean here, with all the non-state players, with with the levels of intervention, with the with the idea that, frankly, we, in some cases, you can look at at even something like the United Nations or the UN peacekeepers and say these are local actors. These are not even international actors in some sense. I mean, they're they're kind of local. They're they're around us, and you know, the peacekeepers in Lebanon have been here for 40 years now. So they, you know, they have you know we own up with them around us and they're local as well as international actors that have direct influence to state actors and to uh, the elite and to politicians in a way that that is you know that changes the very idea of how we think about sovereignty here donors and their influence on uh, on on the state elite etc especially these days but you know for the past many years is also something uh, you know uh, non-state players from Hezbollah onwards here, you know, obviously this is, is important. So thinking about what sovereignty means and thinking about it in Lebanon, in Palestine, in, in, uh, in, in Syria today, and, you know, different countries like this, the idea is, okay, what does this mean? How can this come back when we're talking about international relations and we're teaching international relations? How can a course in America that's teaching IR simply look at it as U.S. foreign policy and sort of dealing with it in a sort of, you know, old, in a, in a particular form that does not create any kind of complexity or, or you know, nuance to, to the way in which the world or the international is studied. So I think these are these are just some examples. The security is the same. How you know we've written some colleagues have written a lot about how how we view insecurity and how we should try to think about how insecurity is viewed from these different peripheries, from these different regions in Lebanon, the Arab region, South America, etc., and how this travels back into the way we should think about IR. So it shouldn't just be security concerns for uh, uh, even the critical security studies, but you know, vis-a-vis -vis what goes on in the United States or in the West, but more how it's actually understood and viewed and absorbed and resisted in, in the different uh, countries and the different regions. So these are things I think are, I, I personally have learned and I, things are, and I'm continuing to learn as, uh, as we go back. And Arlene, I hope your textbook and others Speaking of the South can be made for free or cheap for the rest of us so we can actually download them or buy them. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not going to learn the lessons. Um, I'm, I'm in that, we're in that process. Um, obviously, we won't speak about the other venues, um, which many of us in the Global South are forced to access to be able to, to make use of these texts. But actually, we're, we're in a conversation with, with, with Rutledge about how to make it available. Um, which is one of the paradoxes of, of trying to produce um, a conversation about the global south um, and decenter. We, we're forced to do so in English through um, publishing houses that 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 are not accessible to, to to huge numbers of professors and students in the global south. So just another one of the paradoxes that we confront in trying to do this type of scholarship. Thank you. That yes, I think um, there were here some fantastic points, and I, I, you can see um, 
we have questions and thank you for our attendees for your questions um, that uh, sort of go in the direction of uh, what you've been saying about the, the, the struggles um, yes, of, of teaching IR in the periphery of all sorts. Um, so uh, I, well, uh, I, I would like to try to maybe rephrase some of these questions. You, you can see them um, and also ask our panelists uh, when I give you the, uh, when I ask you to, to respond to also take um, a chance and maybe respond to each other from what have uh, been said before. Uh, so please feel free to jump in on that. Um, there, I can maybe just try the first three questions here. Um, so one about how uh, students, as I think this is in the case of Lebanon, how students react, will react to a so-called Lebanon-centric IR uh, teaching approach um, when the role of non-state actors uh, isn't so-called recognized, uh, and how about also using concepts, uh, so IR concepts when they're not produced from, from the global south. Um, so this is a first question. Uh, a second broad question about uh, whether we're talking explicitly or not about post-colonial studies, decoloniality in uh, our teaching, and um, a, uh, um, a bit more maybe on, on um, challenges of teaching IR in developing countries. So here, the, the, the coining of, of being in a developing country. Um, yeah, maybe we can start with these three. I think that question is the, is for Karim, so maybe you want to start this time. Uh, I'm sorry, but it, it was cutting, so I, I couldn't hear the question, I, so I, I apologize. Sir. All right, so, um, so just about uh, how students in Lebanon re react to uh, uh, a different IR teaching uh, in which there would be more agency led and also context-centric sort of approach um, and uh, um, also maybe any reactions to using IR concepts that doesn't seem to be produced from uh, the global south? No, I, I mean, I, I would say, um, I think if, if I understood the question that, I mean, of course, again, uh, with the disclaimer that it's teaching at AUB as opposed to at the Lebanese University or, or some of the other public universities, uh, you know, which, which is very different, uh, no doubt. I think the, the idea of, you know, introducing different concepts, we, you know, I, I, in, this, in this essay that I think you, you've, um, I, I think you put out for, for people to, to maybe they can, they can download it. Uh, I mean, I try to show that we've, that myself, but also colleagues of ours, that that you know, as a group, we've been we've been trying to teach over the past decade or so. It, it, the the way we've been trying to teach has evolved, I would say, over the past decade, uh, including the kind of readings and the kind of textbooks, whether undergraduate and certainly then you know the kinds of readings and the, and the graduate seminars. They've they've shifted, you know, as I've tried to, in a sense, make uh, uh, respond a little bit to student interests and, and what I think works with students. So rather than simply organize it around, you know, here's the realists, here's the liberals, here's the, you know, this kind of thing and go through it as some, as, as when I started, I was teaching in that way, just, just you know, uh, just kind of following a, a, a normal way of doing so. Uh, it's much, it's focuses more on trying to take topics and themes that are relevant to what's going on around us and then trying to think, and then trying to catch that and think conceptually through these kinds of themes, so you know things like refugees, uh, you know, trying to try to just sort of, you know focus on, on the refugees, etc., as a topic, as a theme, and then say, okay, well, how, how do we, how is this studied? How do we think about it within international relations? And try to come up with two or three things that are relevant in that way. And you know, so humanitarianism, um, climate change, uh, you know, other things that we can then go through this and try to say. All right. Well, it's studied in this way, but you know, in when talking about climate change or when you're talking about refugees, what does what does it mean 
to talk about sovereignty in, in this case. Uh, what, what is the connection between this interventionist? That, when we're talking about the Arab uprisings, you mentioned, I mean, there was a lot of focus at the very beginning of the Arab uprisings that, okay, now finally, uh, it, well, I mean, that is Western scholars, frankly, or, or I should say scholars in the West, and especially in the United States, there was a huge production of articles and books that came out as a result of this, including in the Gulf, that which had just opened up to American and scholars in America and in the West uh, through universities and through various institutes that that was finally accessible to them. And so you ended up saying, okay, well, that, and including the ACSS, the Arab Council of Social Society. So the idea was, okay, finally, we can open the black box. We can now finally study Arab societies because, you know, we hadn't studied them before. Nobody knew because, you know, the this thing of Arab dictatorship and authoritarianism, so, you know, exceptionalism, so it didn't really matter. Now, finally, we can study them. And there was a big push to say, okay, well, we no longer want to study the international because now this is really about the local. It's about building up local governance and building up, you know, social movements from below, et cetera, et cetera. So it's as though there was a kind of denial that the international still existed in terms of intervention, in terms of various other forces. Uh, so th this, you know, th this evolution also was quite interesting to see, you know, uh, to try to connect from in our classroom, what does it mean to build something from below? What does it mean in its connection with the international, both theoretically, but also just practically and, and empirically and, and, and in our everyday experience even? And at the same time, how does this get mediated? Really through the sovereign state? I mean, is the state the, the main unit, the main mechanism through which this takes place? So this is, the, I think this is the, if I understood the question anyway, this is the kind of approach uh, that builds on what's going on, looks at the, the literature, the more critical literature. So more as, as the years went by, we've been using more and more the kind of critical, the sociological and critical literature that make more sense. Uh, and, and some of the kind of realist stuff that makes sense. The, the, you know, we find that in the classroom, the thing that makes less sense to the students, well, not less sense, but less relevant are sometimes the institutionalists, the neoliberal institutionalist approaches, the liberal approaches where, you know, international law and institutions as such are not given much credibility, <clears throat> you know, maybe for obvious reasons. So this is this is how I, you know, this is the kind of thing that I, you know, have been going through in the classroom itself. Thank you. Um, maybe I can throw in some more questions and uh, see if Dr. Caroline um, uh, wants to jump in on those particularly or come back to uh, the ones I mentioned previously. Uh, but there are some really interesting questions. Uh, so uh, one about uh, whether there are, or if we, you, you think there should be IR programs uh, to train PhD master's students to actually teach IR in the periphery and how, what would that look like or should look like? Um, and uh, there was also a question about um, how, uh, for instance, uh, someone in Brazil can have access to uh, scholarship by uh, uh, people in the Arab world uh, um, uh, because uh, it, it seems to, to, as just Karim was mentioning, that it comes maybe more from, from, from uh, the West. Um, so me just here, uh, I, I was thinking that it relates maybe to our question about languages. So learning languages, uh, so maybe uh, trying Arabic. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's, that's yeah, here uh, there is this sometimes this, this uh, yeah, language barrier that can also be there in addition to uh, uh, accessing these, these texts. Um, and uh, also a question about, um, if we can talk about an institutionalization of the third way uh, of uh, approaching IR, is there, can we um, uh, see that happening uh, already? Um, I'll start if that's okay. Um. I, um, I think Sylvia, Sylvia um, who posed the question about um, her research in, or an observation about her research in the Arab world using um, Paulo Freire's philosophy of education is an important one. Um, she also asked where she can get um, Karim's article. It's in international studies perspectives. 
um, I just downloaded it. Um, maybe we can find a link, but it's it was published and it came out in December of last year, right, Karim? Just just to respond to Sylvia's question, I think Sylvia poses a fundamental question, and, and we've already mentioned it. That this whole the whole challenge of how to strike up um, conversations between distinct nodes um, of the periphery or the global south um, that are not, again, mediated by the north, um, to me is, is actually the question <laughs> that we have to be asking. Um, and I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, I, you know, I guess I would start by saying that the fact that, that, that we are all here talking about this um, obviously points to, to, to our own elitist um, nature as scholars um, in different countries in the global south. Um, if we weren't at elitist institutions that are more outward looking, that um, have participated in processes of internationalization, that favor um, English, the English language, then we wouldn't be um, having this conversation to begin with. And so, I think it's probably um, important to say that, it, that it's also our, um, I don't know if it's a political or a moral ethical duty, but we do have a duty, I think, um, specific scholars in, in the Global South to make this happen. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's several challenges at play. I guess we would have to do so um, in English until we can figure out, a, 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 you know, an, a third way to be able to go about having these conversations. but. If, if, I, if I were to be asked, you know, in, in what types of activities international funders and even northern funders interested in issues of the global south should be investing their money, I would say that it, it should be in, 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 in supporting um, these, these conversations that, that are more south-south, um, uh, you know. There's, there's different um, initiatives that, that southern states have tried to promote, um, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, I'm thinking of, um, you know, IPSA or, you know, Briti the BRICS, but, you know, these are also conversations mediated by state interests. So I think, you know, both our institutions and, you know, as elite institutions and funders should, should start actually looking into how to create um, these, these more direct conversations. And I guess on a positive note, um, we're having one right now. Um, it's being mediated by the ISA, but the ISA, you know, is a global is a global um, professional um, institution. So, you know, thinking about too um, how the International Studies Association, which is the space in which we're having this conversation today, um, might promote um, greater pluralism um, and conversation um, within the association and with and within the field. I think should start directing its attention also more to how to be support these direct conversations that again are unmediated by, by the North. I'm not saying that you know, Northern scholars can't participate in them, but going through the North always as the node through which or the space that convenes us, I do think has um, you know, certain problems that we haven't thought through perhaps sufficiently. And now I appreciate these spaces because they give us the opportunity to have the, the conversations, but it's something that needs to be, I think, thought through um, more systematically. And that's, I think, pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, I think these are great questions and somehow they're related. Um, I, I just want to preface my, my comments that, that I'm quite a believer in technology, even though I know there's a digital divide and there's a lot of grassroots things going on that have managed to subvert at least some of the restrictions and access to materials. So apart from open access, which has its own issues. Um, I do think, for example, this question of pedagogy is important. Um, uh, I do have friends who have, uh, who have come from education programs and usually they just create websites or there are existing websites where you can upload material and share material like syllabi, uh, best practices in teaching, um, maybe contents or that sort of thing. So many pedagogical interventions and you put them all in one site because I don't think if I'm not mistaken that they're copyrighted material. So, and, and this will be accessible to anyone who has an internet connection and can be printed for those who don't. Um, and it would be free. It's just, of course, it requires more effort on our part to do and to set up and maybe some technical knowledge. But I think that creating that kind of barrier free access to 
way, ways of rethinking and, and teaching in such a way is very important. And I think Nasif asked this question, and this is one thing that we've been getting into through another program called the Decolonial Studies Program, that one of our outputs for this research program is a teaching module, which has uh, references from you know, the internet, which are easily accessible, or maybe activities that you can do with students who don't have much access to resources. And uh, we, we try, try to solicit opinions from uh, different practitioners, many anthropologists as well, on how to do this. And I think that this is possible for IR if, it, if we're talking about individual decision making on the level of teaching because of the structural constraints. And, and this is why I, I think I started at the very beginning talking about the structural constraints, because no matter how much political will you have as an individual, if you're not placed correctly or you don't have the right networks in many global South countries in, in positions of power, then you have very little um, influence over what can be taught or what should be taught, what ought to be taught, or even in terms of breaking through gatekeepers, because sometimes it's not just about the structures, it's it's, it's certain people within the department who say, no, this is how IR should be taught. It's realism, liberalism, constructivism, and that's it. All of you critical scholars, uh, the, you are all peripheral and marginal. You know, it's even, it's even people we know and talk to. So, so how, do we, how do we change these mentalities? Um, or maybe even those who wish to emphasize in the practice dimension. So this is not just about you know, theoretical constraints, but also those who say, well, you know, I want to be a diplomat and theory doesn't matter. So we've also encountered these types of people who say, oh, no, everything should be inductively done and derived from what I do as a diplomat. Um, so I do think that technology offers some way to alleviate these issues. I don't want to be a complete believer in it, but also the translation issue. Now that there, uh, there's DeepL, so I'm, I'm getting into some of the, these coding groups, and uh, DeepL translates into many languages and quite accurately. And I think that moving forward, if this technology becomes more widely available, we can start having these conversations where people speak a certain language that is incomprehensible to an English, French, uh, whatever speaker. And, and, and at least, okay, maybe conceptual things are difficult to translate, but at least we can talk to each other once such a technology becomes more widely available and accessible and not completely you know, um, uh, expensive or inaccessible financially. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, post-colonial and decolonial introductions into syllabi. We have been trying, so the Philippine International Studies Organization have been trying to influence the way curricula are conceived in the Philippines. And I will tell you, it is an uphill struggle. It's an uphill struggle because precisely you meet these types of people who have a very specific way of thinking what IR is, is and how it should be taught. And these people have positions of power. So we've tried to do this at a public university and at a private university. And the blockade, well, let's say uh, opposition has been quite strong, um, introducing more critical perspectives. And perhaps it would be interesting maybe to start small with a class. And I think this has been done to a certain degree in, in the University of the Philippines. There are certain classes where you can introduce these ideas. And once that seed is spread, maybe more people will be open-minded about uh, you know, local perspectives, et cetera. So these are some of the things that can be done in the face of scrutiny and gatekeeping. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think those, I think uh, it seems here that, that yeah, we, we've shared um, struggles, but maybe also this is a way to express what we wish to see, so our wish list for, how um, teaching in IR in the periphery can be improved. Um, so thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, thank you, Karim, Arlene, uh, Frankie, for, for um, uh, responding and, and also for jumping in and answering some of the, the questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm sorry, I, uh, we won't be able to go through all of them. Um, and um, I... Uh, yeah, I think uh, we should, if it's all right with our panelists, stop um, here. Um, and also, uh, my wish list is maybe in, in 10 years we can come back and teach, say something new and maybe better about um, this experience. I also want to uh, leave the floor to our um, Global South Caucus Chair, Eric Dejila. Thank you for joining us for uh, a final word 
Um, so please. Thank you very much, Zina. Um, good afternoon or good, good evening, according to where you are. I'm very pleased to see that uh, we had uh, this very important uh, conversation on how to teach uh, Aria from the periphery. And I'm very glad that uh, uh, this topic uh, has been covered by distinguished colleagues who works on this issue. I uh, just would like to mention that the Global South Caucus is an academic platform dedicated to promote the study of the South as a whole, relevant South societies, and the relation between the North and the South, but also, as Arlene mentioned, South-South relations. So I will, I will encourage uh, those of you who have an interest on these issues to um, become a member of the Global South Caucus, because I do believe that it's a platform which will uh, support uh, the promotion of uh, research and uh, network on issues that we, we cherish. And thank you again for organizing this uh, great event.